All right, these are the original slides that I created when I was explaining InnerSource to PayPal now six years ago. So that just so you know what you're looking at. Um, there's uh, an easy way to understand this that involves a drawing that I make uh, usually on a whiteboard, but because you can't do that on Zoom, we're gonna use this presentation that kind of chunks through the same drawing. And um, all right, here we go. So let's say that you have a siloed organization and you have a core capability that lives in a big silo, but people on the outside and the edges of the company need to be able to touch that silo in order to get work done. Maybe they need to create localized versions of things or, or um, you know, there's lots of, lots of plausible reasons why people would need to do this. So they send a feature request because that's how the company works, right? And the core doesn't do anything about it because the core didn't see it coming. It's not on their work list. They've got other stuff to do. They're going to wait. And eventually the boss of the remote side you know, calls up the guy and says, why didn't you get this done? And he says, well, it's over with the core people. They haven't responded yet. And so then, and we always draw the bosses as cheeses. So then that, that's a Swiss cheese up there. So the Swiss cheese calls, it's it, the Swiss cheese that owns the core thing, yells at him for a while. Eventually they make some guy do the feature, whatever the feature is, right? This is a pretty normal way of doing business in normal engineering companies these days. But the problem is nobody learns anything in this process, right? The guy, the guy in the, that received the request is pissed off because somebody yelled at him. The guy that sent the request is late now because it took too long. And, and the cheeses have, you know, said some words. Um, so we thought about doing it a different way, the way that Apache does things. This is called the contribution triangle. And it came from the documentation that Dr. Roy Fielding wrote when he was describing how Apache works. And one of the things that his, he, he wrote his master's thesis on this. And one of the things that he discovered is there's a pretty natural progression of the percentage of users to contributors to trusted committers, and then eventually to leads in Apache projects. It's about a progression of 10. So for a thousand users, there are gonna be a hundred contributors. That means everybody that ever gave a scrap of anything to the, to the project. There'll be 10 people who are actually trusted committers, meaning that they actually know enough to get it done. Uh, they, they know everything about the code, they're the senior people. And then maybe one lead or two out of that. So, so this is a really normal progression in open source projects. So what if you made that guy in, in the silo, the big silo, a trusted committer? Meaning that his time, 10% of his time goes directly to mentoring contributions. And uh, when I say 10%, I don't mean he's going to spend half of a day a week. I mean, 10% of his total time, but he gets to focus on that task. So I always say, if you have 30 engineers, you should have three being trusted committers only for every sprint. And you can change it. You can have different ones do it because people in, in companies where people are hired to write code and, and given raises based on their performance as code writers, they're not gonna be thrilled about being asked to do code review. But it turns out that code review and code mentorship are part of the secret sauce of open source. And so in, in groups that have done this thing that I'm describing right now, we've done it a few, well, maybe 50 times now, they always get a bump in quality. 100% of the time there will be a bump in quality because inside of companies, real code review as opposed to just rubber stamping your friends, um, doesn't happen so much because velocity and that imperative to drive forward makes you take you know, chances. So this is the idea that you throw that out. You start code, re code reviewing everything, okay? Now, if this guy's a trusted committer, instead of sending a feature request, the, the guy from Brazil is gonna send an actual pull request because he's gonna have read the code in the silo and send a best guess, right? And then the trusted committer's job is to write back advice about how to make that pull request mergeable, whatever the, that advice is. And some of this you can pre-describe, um, like 
we have a certain coding style, we require a certain amount of unit testing or whatever the thing is that they have to get done so that that first pull request will be as close as possible. But a lot of times that advice is the kind of stuff that only the trusted committers know because they're experts in that silo. Now, the truth is everybody should have access to that information, but there's no good mechanism for that, that to be externalized. Doing documentation sprints is not very effective to get at this problem. All right, so now let's talk about the rewards in this relationship we just described. So when the patch gets merged from the Brazil side, that guy, of course, he's gotten his work done and that's an intrinsic reward. So he's, he's happy, right? But the question is, what about the trusted committer? What kind of reward drives their behavior? Because their real job is to work on that silo's code. So how come they're having to take time out to look at other people's code, right? Well, we saw a lot of real benefits that those trusted committers gain. One of the biggest ones in, in really siloed organizations, they've often been told they need to modularize, but they can't figure out how to do it because looking at the code base, it's like you're asking them whether they should cut off their children's you know, arm or leg to them because they see it as a whole holistic thing because they have understanding of it. But after they've had to explain it to somebody on the outside, they start understanding why it's unintelligible. All of a sudden they can see why they need to refactor and where and how to do it. And we saw that happen over and over again at PayPal. So I know that's a real thing. But the real value of this whole thing is if you capture that conversation between the trusted committer and the contributor, however many times of mentorship it takes, to actually get that, that package or that pull request to be mergeable and you store it somewhere that can be accessed again, then the next time somebody wants to do a similar thing, you don't have to spend the time to do the mentorship. You could probably cut that time in half or even, even down to a quarter of the time per PR because you can ask them to go read the documentation that was just accreted. Right? So one of the secret sauces of open source is the documentation is kept forever in an archived, easily uh, searchable way. You heard me talk about this a little bit with Tim O'Reilly because I think this is starting to erode even in open source, but it's definitely not happening inside big companies unless there's an explicit push to do it. And we've been working with the various code management tools to try to get them to make this easier. This is a really important thing. So at the end of the day, when Singapore, a new remote group, wants to send a PR, they can be told to go read the fine manual, right? Uh, and this happens at Apache all the time and it saves the trusted committers a lot of pain and suffering. And it, frankly, it makes the contributors more, gives them more agency because they can study at their own pace and figure out what they need to know to do stuff. So if Singapore starts talking to Brazil about how to get this pull request merged, who's the trusted committer now? This is another benefit of this process. You can feasibly become an expert in somebody else's code base through you know, doing these kinds of packages more, or, or patches more than once. And that is a way that those core maintainers find other people they might want to hire from within the company. But it's also a way to break down the barriers because I've never met an engineering organization of any size where the various groups of engineers didn't have um, prejudices about each other. You know, the people that are on the edges are more like UI engineers, therefore the core transactional engineers think they're lesser engineers. Right. And meanwhile, the core people are using some very old fashioned methods and the UI guys are kind of, you know, pissed off about that. But if they actually work together, it turns out they're just all engineers, they're people and they're, I've never seen a project where the core engineers weren't quite surprised that some of those contributors are actually pretty intelligent. So uh, just so you know, this will improve all of the cultural ills that we're talking about. Now, to get that trusted committer over the hump of feeling resentful because they're being asked to not code for a while, um, 
we thought about a lot of different extrinsic rewards. That's extra stuff you give to the trusted committer. The most effective one we found, we thought about beer for a while. That's what, that's a drawing of beer. Um, but it, it, this was a company where most of the um, engineers were Southeast Asian and a shockingly high number of them didn't drink beer, which is understandable. Um, the truth is what they cared about was how, could they get agency in the forward progression of their career? They were all senior. They were on the important stack. They didn't have any way to get off the important stack except to take up management. So what if you made it possible for the trusted committer through their own work to indicate that they are looking at the whole stack, not just the little silo they live in? We didn't have enough full stack engineers at PayPal. So we made extrinsic rewards that rewarded them for showing breadth of interest and breadth of mastery which put them on the fellow track, which is supposed to be the way that individual contributors get ahead in their careers, but it was never clear how you got on it until we made an on-ramp, okay? Then this is a quick slide about tooling. We talked a lot about coming up with a way for people to collect badges for good, good efforts that they did. Um, and the HR people hated this idea. Uh, I have heard of other companies that have implemented this idea. I think it's a good one personally, because you. What you want is to create ownership through participation. So if you can create a killer resume internally, I mean, so that you can get lateral opportunities by directly working in Intersource, there's another reward, right? Um, and then this is uh, an idea about tooling. It doesn't work to force tools on people. What works is to meet them where they're at. So I wanted a tool for PayPal that recognize that they use a hegemony of tools for communication and to make it as easy as possible for them to send ephemera and artifacts into the document archive. Now, we'd made a, we made a cut at this, but both Salona and I left PayPal before this was really up and running very well. I think Russ Rutledge's team is, is doing a, an attempt at making this work now as well. This is the main thing I would like to see GitHub fix for us. All right. And the last thing is we thought it would be cool to have a website and come up with an organization called Intersource Commons in 2014. And here we are six years later and you, you're now visiting us. So it is possible to you know, envision and then dream and then make things happen. I'm just gonna say, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to have done this here. We also thought about writing a book <laughs> and we did. And it's 26 pages. You can get it on public GitHub. It is the most downloaded non-code asset on public GitHub. So if you haven't seen Getting Started with Intersource, it's, it's a very concise little story that you can take to management and say, I think we'd like to try this. And that's why we wrote it. We've done other books since then, but we had no idea this one was gonna be so popular. So go check that out. And that is what the title is. And that is my presentation.